This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. That's a great introduction to uh, our debate that we're going to have this morning since we don't have the results of the best trial, is uh, really to ask this question about initial strategy uh, of open bypass being better uh, than uh, endovascular, and Dr. Conti and Dr. Uh, Saab is going to discuss this, so we're going to have perspectives from uh, a surgeon and an interventionist. So here's the the question that we'd like you to vote on. A lot of a lot of options there. I think uh, we're going to end up with a bell-shaped curve, maybe. <laughs> All right. So I think the audience here is uh, uh, questioning uh, whether or not uh, we should do anything but bypass, and uh, we'll see if the vote changes after the comments uh, from the pro and uh, con. So to start off the debate, Dr. Conti. All right. Thank you. So the debate is uh, framed around, I think, a more reasonable question than, than the usual, which is, you know, is bypass best for some patients and which ones and why? So I'll try to go through how I think about this right now. Again, these are my disclosures. What are we trying to achieve in the patients in the, with advanced limb ischemia? Relieve pain, heal wounds, preserve a functional limb. <clears throat> Those things, I think we all agree, require effective revascularization of the limb. That's really the cornerstone of vascular therapy for these patients. We also recognize at the same time that they are at high risk for major cardiovascular events. So whatever we do, we need to be very careful about their medical management, their lifestyle, and to reduce their risks of heart attack, stroke, and and maintain survival. So we have to do both of these things. I'm going to start out with a quick case <clears throat> because I think this highlights the question. 58-year-old diabetic with stable coronary disease and hypertension presented to an outside hospital with pain in his foot. Initially, he was treated with antibiotics. He came back a few weeks later with erythema and an ulcer on his right foot. The record said his plain films are unremarkable, whatever that means. He was sent out on oral Keflex came back three days later with really a threatened limb. And it was only at that point that it was realized that he had no pedal pulses. He now had gangrenous changes in two toes. He had evidence of systemic sepsis. Had an angiogram done outside, which focused on iliac disease and showed bilateral fempop disease. And he had actually an iliac stent on the side of index side. And he was transferred to us, where he immediately required an open TMA. I'll show you the foot. And vein mapping said that he had an intact saphenous vein. So here's his foot. You can see that he's got three, uh, frankly, ischemic digits. He's got redness going up the dorsum of his foot. And on the plantar aspect of his foot, it was actually tender. He required an initial drainage amputation. His angiogram, and I'll apologize because actually the, the leg on, the, on your left is a leg of interest, and there's a cutoff in the overlap here. But the SFA is actually open to just above the adductor canal where it stops. And then the entire popliteal segment is occluded through the TP trunk. And you can see here re reconstitution of a posterior tibial artery as a dominant vessel. He has a contralateral SFA occlusion. And here's his runoff down to the foot. So he has a distal SFA and popliteal total occlusion with two vessel runoff to the foot and major tissue loss. And there you are in the, in the room with your catheter. Do you try to cross this and try to treat this endo in a patient with major tissue loss? I did not. I think it's pretty clear in my mind that this patient is, a, is best treated by a bypass. He's an average risk patient, major tissue loss. He has a good vein. So his initial procedure was an SFA to PT bypass using a non-reverse vein. He went on to get closure of his foot, and this is him a year later. 
uh, happily with a pulse in his leg and, and doing quite well in his, in his shoes. And we're obviously watching his other leg very closely. He's a highly functional person who works in a job where he's uh, has a, a fairly amount of demand on his lower extremities. So the basic tenets I'll try to convince you of is that pretty much every, almost everybody with CLI who's not uh, at an advanced stage of disability should be offered revascularization. And both endo and open clearly have a role. And the outcomes for both we know need to get better. We have a lot of patients who don't do well with either or the other. The technology is evolving. However, I think it's, it's, it's deceitful to think that we really don't know how these are going to do. We really know, for a large degree, the factors that are associated with bad outcome for either endo or open. And so we should avoid those to try to maximize clinical success. And I think it's really important to, again, reiterate that technical success, while intoxicating on the angiogram, does not equate to clinical success for the patients. Durability is actually important for most patients with advanced limb ischemia because treatment failure in these patients carries consequences, which I'll show you. So the optimal approach is really flexible. You have to be selective, stratifying the patients by their overall risk, their limb risk, and their ana anatomic factors. So we look at the general health of the patient. We look at the foot itself, of course. What's the likelihood of functional limb salvage? But also, what's it going to take to achieve that? How long is the revascularization going to have to work? How much blood flow do we think they need? How severe is the limb ischemia? Where is the disease? What interventions have they already had? And I always know, before I take a patient to the cath lab, to the, o to the OR for an angiogram, do they have a vein? Because that affects my aggressiveness with endovascular treatment. So you need to know that up front. So again, it's patient risk, severity of the limb threat, and vascular anatomy. Those are the three key factors in decision making in every patient with advanced limb ischemia. And it's important to recognize that in our literature, all of these feet on this slide would be considered Rutherford 5. So this is the first problem we have. And we try to compare outcomes in the literature. Rutherford 5 includes anything that can result up to a TMA. Now, Rutherford 6 is actually defined as a non-salvageable foot. So you can have minor tissue loss this small, and you can have something that needs a full TMA. And in the literature, it's very confusing to compare these outcomes. So, but you could recognize that the magnitude of revascularization that might be required and its durability may, may vary quite a lot for these different settings of CLI. So the modern definition of so-called critical limb ischemia is really actually called into question. The idea that there's one level of ischemia that, that you could define as critical and one uh, perfusion improvement that would, be, would satisfy all of these scenarios. So how do we estimate the severity of limb threat across the spectrum of neuroischemia? It's really three critical factors. It's the severity of the ischemia, it's the degree of tissue loss, and it's also the importance of infection, because the presence and severity of infection in the foot has a really dominant effect on the outcome for the limb beyond the, the ischemia. And so we won't go into this in detail, but uh, within the last year and a half, the SVS came up with a new stratification scheme to replace Rutherford to be much more uh, stratified about limb threat. So this is the so-called Wi-Fi system based on the extent and depth of the wound, uh, gradations of ischemia, and the presence and extent of foot infection. I think the future is that we need to define key uh, stages of threatened limb, and there's going to be better approaches by stage. And until we do that, when we put all these people together in one bucket, we really have a, a hard time figuring out what's best. Well. We know that endovascular therapy has, can have a great effect on many of our patients, but we also know that it's kind of silly to say that there's no cost ever, because there's plenty of cases out there, and we all see them, we're in practice, uh, where things go awry. And these are the kind of things that we're trying to avoid. You know, stenting all the way down to the tibial artery where then there's a below knee amputation. Or on the right-hand side, someone getting a complete full metal jacket all the way through their popliteal artery for claudication, only to need an emergent bypass for limb salvage uh, to a tibial artery when previously they might have been able to get a fem pop. These are not things that anybody wants to happen, but they do happen and they do affect the outcome. So, you know, the challenges for revascularization in CLI differ a little bit based on whether you're an endovascular approach or a surgical approach. So multi-level disease is very common. That's a bigger challenge for endo than for bypass. Long segment disease and CTOs are common. That's also a bigger challenge for endo. Tibial disease is common. That, that potentially affects both, but probably affects endovascular more, as does extensive calcification. 
Maybe 25, 30% of patients don't have a good vein. That's obviously more of an issue for open surgery. I think these issue of advanced tissue loss requirements that you need to support the healing of a foot reconstruction, which may take weeks or months to heal, and many comorbid conditions that slow that wound healing down, like diabetes, malnutrition, advanced renal disease, these, I think, probably affect endo more because the durability of revascularization, you don't want that revascularization to fail while the wound is still healing. And there's a comorbidity burden which probably affects open surgery more. You know, higher risk patients are obviously a bigger issue for a bigger operation. It's important to recognize we all know that you get a diabetic foot ulcer to heal, unfortunately, somewhere between 20 and 80 percent are going to recur within a year. So given the fact that these patients are largely going to be around, the issue of durability does become important in terms of another lesion at another time and, and what's their circulation like. The task concept is dated. You know, it's really focused on FEMPOP disease, and we have this uh, background where, you know, if you have minor disease in your, in your uh, femoral popliteal segment, endo is clearly advantaged, and if you have diffuse occlusions involving the popliteal artery or the whole SFA, surgery is preferred. This has been of some use, but I think it's very dated now. I think the caveat here is, is that this was looked at through, purely through the lens of endovascular. You know, arterial disease severity is the primary factor for endovascular success, but vein quality is really the primary factor for lower extremity bypass success. So where does that weigh in here? It's not even part of the scheme. Um, and more importantly, most patients, as he said, have multi-level disease, so TASC has limited relevance. And I think the problem with TASC is it led to people thinking in terms of lesions only not in terms of the whole limb. And they don't add up the outcome based on the number of lesions. They just look at the lesion and say, well, that's you know, this or that, and I should do this. And that's really not the way we should practice. This is a really interesting paper that came out a number of years ago that looks at the anatomy of disease in patients with critical limb ischemia. And I just want to point out, and so this is from uh, Will Hyatt and, and colleagues looking at the distribution of occlusions. If you look at patients with rather uh, Fontan 3 or 4, which is rest pain or tissue loss, the high percentage of popliteal and below the knee disease, it's not surprising. But then if you look here on, these are all patients with CLI with pop and tib occlusions, and where else they have disease, with a high percentage also have femoral disease. So across all of these categories, particularly in the categories of diabetes and renal failure. So multi-level disease is not the exception, it's the rule. And I think this is a big challenge for, for us when we do inter intervention. Also, the degree of tissue loss uh, is an issue. So some of the administrative data sets that have looked at the outcomes of PVI or intervention uh, with critical limb ischemia have not looked so pretty. So this is a look, uh, it's, more, it's about a decade old now, but these are patients getting endovascular treatment in the Medicare population. 30-day <clears throat> mortality, 7%. Complications 14%, 30% rehospitalizations, including reinterventions uh, in, you know, 12% needed a repeat PCI, 2% a bypass within 30 days. But this is the most alarming thing 30 day amputation rate of 17% in the patients with advanced limb ischemia. That's a very high number. Now, some of those may not have been salvageable, it could be judgment. But here's another study that looks like almost the same. Again, this is looking at angioplasty in advanced limb ischemia, it is dated, but major amputation rates for patients with the most severe tissue loss looked high. So this is a little bit worrisome. It could be that we're trying things as a last ditch effort on some of these patients, uh, but I think patients with advanced tissue loss, it's a real question whether or not endovascular interventions are gonna be effective. And multiple studies, as I mentioned, have shown that the types of disease we end up seeing here, which are long lesions, CTOs, calcified vessels, and lots of tissue loss, these are negative predictors for endovascular success. Here's a look from the University of Pittsburgh at below the knee disease, and I think we all recognize that angioplasty is still the workhorse below the knee for tibial disease, and it can work, technically successful, but here again, the primary patency for endovascular interventions below the knee, we've seen this many times, anywhere between 30 and 50% at one year. Uh, whether or not this is going to be adequate for the patient at hand, can it be repeated? Certainly it can, but is this really uh, the best approach? Uh, it's not clear to me that it is. Bypass surgery, we know, is, uh, has got a lot of, of data behind it. It's versatile. The results are pretty well documented, but it has limitations. There's wound complications, prolonged recovery, 
There is the need for vein surveillance and reintervention. It's technically demanding. And if you don't have a good conduit or you have high medical risk, the outcomes are not as good. Medical risk is important. This is the P3 CLI risk score. Here's the key factors. Older patients, particularly those with renal failure uh, and advanced cardiac disease, if you had multiple of these risk factors, the amputation-free survival after open bypass surgery was less than 50%. So that's not great. But this is only 10% of the, of the overall group of patients. So there's a small group of patients who we consider for surgery who maybe we should really not be considering for surgery. They don't do so well. This was validated in the vascular surgery group of New England. Again, a small percentage of patients, but they really did not have a great outcome. So certain factors are very high risk. But the dominant factor in terms of the outcome is the quality of the vein. It's been shown over and over again. Here in the PREVENT-3 trial, if you have an adequate caliber vein greater than 3.5 millimeters, the patency rates are quite excellent. And very importantly, if you have an optimal conduit, single segment vein of adequate diameter, uh, it's important to recognize the one-year results are really quite good. But even more importantly, I think, in my mind, is that no, it doesn't matter how far down the leg you need to go, whether it's a fem pop or a fem tib, if you have a good vein, the results are excellent. Uh, and so the level of the distal anastomosis is not so important for the bypass if there's a good vein. The basal trial we already talked about, but this was the secondary analysis based on the treatment that patients actually got. So here's where you can see that a bypass with vein is so far superior to a bypass with prosthetic, which is pooled into the outcome results. But also of interest, the patients who got their bypass after a failed angioplasty did not do as well as those who got their bypass up front. Now this is not a randomized comparison, so you have to be careful, but we've also looked at this in a much larger group of patients in the vascular surgery group of New England. And if you look at patients who got their bypass surgery after a failed previous treatment, which is in red, compared to those who got their bypass as a first treatment, it's very clear that the patients who are getting the secondary procedure as a bypass do not do as well. And in fact, these curves keep getting farther apart as time goes on. So the secondary bypass surgery we already know is not great, but it includes secondary bypass after failed endovascular treatment. And unfortunately, if we only do bypass after endo fails, this is what it's going to look like. So here's my last slide. Who benefits more from open bypass in my practice right now? The average risk patient with more severe limb threat and bad anatomy for endo. And clearly, there is bad anatomy for endo. Despite the fact that we can get across almost anything, the results are not that great. So multi-level disease with CTOs, lots of calcification severe common femoral and trifurcation disease if they have an adequate vein and runoff to the foot is intact. This is still about a third to a half the patients who are referred to my practice with advanced limb ischemia, and this is kind of the way I approach it. I look at these factors, and for patients who are average risk, good life expectancy, major tissue loss, bad anatomy for endo, and they have a vein, I'm going to favor bypass first, but there's quite a lot of patients also in this group. And of certainly some patients maybe should just be palliated. So with that, um, I'll let my counter-debater. Thank you, Mike. I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Fadi Saab to come up uh, to the stage here. And uh, you might say, hold on that scalpel, Dr. Conti. Uh, Dr. Saab, who I have not met, uh, is an associate professor at uh, Michigan State uh, University School of Medicine. He's an interventional cardiologist and a specialist in uh, critical limb ischemia and has, and has formed a, uh, a limb salvage uh, center uh, in his practice in Michigan. And uh, happy you could make it uh, this morning and look forward to your comments. Um, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Conti, for the invitation. My colleague, Dr. Mustafa, was supposed to be here, but uh, for uh, family reasons, he was not able to. But uh, we're really happy to be part of this, uh, uh, this meeting. So thank you. All right, so um, when uh, they told me these are my disclosures, none of them are related to uh, the content of this talk. These are my talking points for here. When they told me I'm going to be talking about uh, endovascular therapy for CLI therapy, I said, that's great. That's, that's awesome, and, uh, and I went to the literature and I started pulling out papers, and you know, you have all of these uh, information about critical limb ischemia and uh, uh, looking at disparative outcomes and looking at endpoints, all the points that uh, mentioned. What's not great is uh, the offer is uh, my debater right here. 
So uh, I said uh, maybe I should throw in the white towel already and, and, uh, and stop right then and there. But I said, you know what, Let me, uh, Dr. Owens promised me they're going to be nice to me, so I'm going to take it from there. And I'm holding you to it. So uh, CLI patients, a lot of information. Uh, you know, Dr. Conti and I did not really compare slides, but uh, we, you'll notice a lot of information I'm presenting here today. It's going to be similar to what he was talking about. But, but these are some of the things that I think of as an endovascular specialist. Disease patterns, availability of venous conduits, physician training and experience, and clinical evaluation. Um, you know, I don't have a Dr. Conti next to me where I am. I don't have Dr. Owens there. So uh, surgical endo endovascular skill sets, uh, treatment biases. Um, and in my opinion, there are selection uh, bias in trials comparing surg surgery versus endovascular therapy. It has to be. Um, the, be the basal trial, Dr. Conti went through it. Um, I'm not going to labor over it again. I just want to point out, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting when, 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 uh, when two physicians from different specialties look at a certain trial, every person, you know, look at it from a certain perspective. So to me, I was, uh, I was interested in looking at a high, higher rate of uh, uh, morbidity within 30 days with comparing the both arms. And uh, as Dr. Conti mentioned, you know, at two years, uh, the mortality rate was in favor of the bypass arm. Um, this is uh, also a paper, uh, same paper Dr. Conti showed earlier that looking at uh, uh, endovascular therapy and outcomes. Uh, and what was interesting to me is 2.7, uh, almost 3% mortality rate at 30 days with endovascular therapy for some of those patients. Now, granted, the mortality was mostly for the patients with a tissue loss, uh, you know, the sickest of a sickest of a patient, uh, which also struck me as high. But, and, and this is also looking at only balloon angioplasty for tibial disease. The best CLI is, is a landmark trial. We're really excited to be a part of it, and we're, uh, we're honored and privileged to be one of the centers uh, participating in the best CLI trial. Um, and again, we went through it. We went through the design of a trial. I'm not going to bore you with too much cardiology. I'm a cardiologist, and I had to bring in one thing in here. This is the Courage trial. It's one of the landmark trials that compared balloon, uh, uh, percutaneous angioplasty, coronary interventions, uh, uh, plus medical therapy versus medical therapy alone. And not to labor this, eventually the, both arms uh, appear to be similar with uh, more favor to uh, intervention in terms of angina relief. But what I want to point out here is if you look at how many patients they had to screen to end up with 2,000 patients out of 35,000 patients, you know, you have to think of the process of how difficult it is to enroll in some of these trials to answer a particular question. So keep that in mind. This is an interesting survey that was actually part of a best CLI. I, I took the liberty of putting it into, into uh, a table. Um, and I understand I'm speaking to, to uh, mostly surgeons in the audience here. And it's interesting because if you look at the surgical arm, and when the question was asked based on anatomy alone, about uh, 50 to 43% of physicians preferred surgery first um, in terms of treating patients with CLI, actually similar to the pre-debate uh, uh, question. So that tells me that uh, you know, most likely the, the most preferred method of revascularization for VCLI patients uh, in a surgeon that does or perform both set of skills, endovascular and surgery, it would be surgery, relatively speaking. Um, this is a, an older paper by Dr. Goodney and colleagues. He did, he did uh, some fine work, and, and it's an interesting paper. The paper actually looked at the variation in evaluating CLI patients who received an amputation. So number one, what was interesting is 50% of these patients did not even, were not even evaluated by a vascular study completely. The other interesting part is that the, the rest of the patients, the 50% of patients, 17% only had an um, evaluation with a vascular study and angiography, 11% had an endovascular therapy, only 3% of patients had bypass surgery. But now this, these are Medicare patients, it's not all patients, um, and it's a it's, it's somewhat older uh, trial looking between 2003 and 2006. So only 3% 3, 3 of patients that underwent amputation. Now I'm, I'm kind of... Uh, um, kind of assuming too much here, but I'm just trying to get a sense of how many surgeries are being done for these CLI sick patients. Um, and if you look at the C they looked at the CPT codes for, for these patients, uh, they looked at the rate of femoral tibial bypasses for these patients over three, three years. Again, the patients that underwent amputation for CLI. And if you, if you add them, it's about 2,185 procedures in three years. Very, very small number, relatively speaking, in, when you're looking at Medicare database. Um, uh, you know, that we, we can talk for hours about uh, patency and infrapopliteal bypass, and, and, you know, when somebody like me sits and listens to Dr. Conti and, and, and you talk about vein bypass and, and conduit, you know, to me, what matters is patient selection and adequacy of, of conduit. But also, when we talk about long-term patency, let's remember that the trials, when they look at long-term patency, they're looking at four years, five years, nothing beyond that. So that's important to remember. 
This is a, this is a, a recent paper that came from Japan looking at uh, mortality rates in patients with uh, critical limb ischemia. Um, and one of the things that we do look at in, in, in best CLI is how many you have to, to, to determine that you think the likelihood of the patient surviving more than two years is high. Well, 40% of these patients, 41% of those patients were dead um, at, uh, before two years. And what they did is they looked at uh, the risk profile of a patient, something that all of us do when we see these patients, look at their heart failure, um, chronic kidney disease, dialysis, um, uh, coronary artery disease, so on and so forth. And let's, let's be honest, a lot of our patients will have this risk profile. So for me, I personally struggle of, of how am I gonna exactly figure out which, which one of my patients uh, that gonna survive beyond, in, beyond, the, beyond two years. Um, I agree, we need the better endpoints uh, for looking at uh, CLI therapy. So limb salvage or uh, limb preserva preservation, uh, is it really the right uh, endpoint to look at? Uh, multiple trials look at uh, the endpoint, and it seems like comparing balloon angioplasty, and balloon angioplasty is, uh, to, to me, as an endovascular specialist, is the older way of treating um, 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 in an endovascular way. There is definitely newer techniques uh, um, um, and technologies that are available right now. Uh, but uh, the outcomes are pretty similar. So uh, one of the things that I utilize as an endovascular specialist, and, and I joined Dr. Conti in his statement, is how can I tailor the therapy so that I can give the most benefit to my patient in these sick patients that are not able to tolerate these procedures. And one of the things that I follow, or we follow in our practice, is angiosome-based therapy, and if you, I'm sure you're familiar with it. It's basically trying to target the therapy to the vessel responsible for the wound. Um, in, in looking at each tibia vessels and each, each one of the collaterals and each one of the branches and which area does it supply, and trying to, if you look at some of the trials that are conducted out there, they're small trials, they're, they're nothing that what we, we, me as a cardiologist, are accustomed to. We're accustomed to 20,000, 30,000 patients in the trials. So, so these are small trials, 200, uh, 500 uh, patients. But relatively speaking, if you look at the patients that underwent angiosome-directed therapy revascularization, uh, their limb preservation and wound healing tend to be somewhat higher than indirect uh, revascularization. Uh, so we, we actually apply this in our practice. You know, we, we try to add this to the electronic medical record of a patient, and we try to determine, based on evaluation of a patient, which vessel is going to be involved, even before we take the patient to non-invasive imaging or invasive imaging. Um, so with that, I'm going to take you through an example which I think is, is, is relevant to what we're going to debate here today, angiosome distribution case. So this is an 83-year-old female. Uh, these are her ABIs, not terrible. Uh, she has multiple comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, chronic kidney disease. She has ischemic cardiomyopathy. She's a bypass patient. She's stable in medical therapy. And uh, she doesn't have any venous conduits. And she presented to my office uh, with this. Um, so this is, this is what I do, kind of a crude way for me just to get a sense of what's going on with the patient, maybe biphasic Doppler signal here, and then uh, I'm not getting any, barely any signal. I, it, it's hard to project over the voice, but uh, maybe monophasic. And I want to show you the wound. It's on, on the lateral aspect of foot and the plantar aspect. All of, our, all of my patients in my practice, uh, you know, we're really happy about the Wi-Fi classification. But all of our patients, you know, we take pictures and we add the pictures. We, me as a cardiologist, I have the pictures in the electronic medical records for something to compare to as we see those patients. So looking at this, you know, my assumption that the angiosome distribution will correspond to the posterior tibial artery and more likely to the lateral plantar circulation uh, of the foot. Uh, in our practice, we take our patients, we do diagnostic, uh, detailed diagnostic angiogram on the patient, and you can see this is a very hostile aortic bifurcation. This is, a, this is gonna be a, a nightmare uh, for my endovascular specialist for this patient. So, um, you know, you, you'd review these films with, with your vascular surgery, uh, surgery colleagues and, uh, or your, your endovascular specialist that you don't like on a particular day, and you say, you're gonna take care of this case. Um, <laughs> And, and this is selective angiography of the right lower extremity to the left of the screen, that's uh, the popliteal occlusion, um, the middle of the screen, you're looking at reconstitution, and this is uh, some tibia reconstitution. And I, and I left it in real time because I wanted to show you how long does it take for the, con this is something that we pay attention to, how long does it take for the contrast to reach the vascular bed with, with selective angiography. And uh, uh, we try to, following the angiosome concept, you can see that um, the perineal artery is filling before the uh, posterior tibial artery and the lateral plantar circulation, uh, kind of affirming what I was suspecting that the patient is, is if I'm going to help this, this patient, maybe I can, I can achieve the most benefit by revascularizing to the posterior tibial artery. 
So, um, you know, it was too late for me to, uh, to do multi, uh, um, to do a polling question, but I wanna, I wanna show you this question. What are the treatment options for this patient? Is this a patient a, a candidate for open surgery or is this patient for endovascular therapy? Uh, let me do something untraditional. Raise your hand if you think this is a, a candidate for vascular surgery. Okay, so, so maybe ha half the room here. Raise your hand if you think this patient is a candidate for endovascular therapy. Okay, I'm a minority here. Okay, so how about this? I think the patient is candidate for none, and, and let me explain myself. Um, so if I was gonna get any votes before the, the, the lecture, I'm not gonna get any right now because I don't have a hat while I'm doing the intervention, so I apologize for that. It's not <laughs> intentional, I swear. Um, so the TAMI technique refers to the tibial pedal arterial minimally invasive retrograde revascularization. It's basically uh, tibial access achieving revascularization in a retrograde fashion without groin access, without radio access. Now, we require to have a detailed and geographic map for the patients before we're able to do this. And we really find that this procedure is helpful in patients who are not able to lay flat or patients that are not able to straighten their leg, uh, that they, you know, they still we deem necessary to revascularize those patients. Um, we, in our institution, my next talk is gonna talk about ultrasound guided access. We use ultrasound in accessing, accessing all of our patients. Uh, and we take ultrasound a step further. We use ultrasound to guide and deliver our therapy, what we call EVAS, extravascular ultrasound. And in this particular patient, we, uh, after we obtain access, retrograde angiogram, suddenly that this patient has two, two vessel runoff, something that I was not able to see even with selective angiography. We were able to cross the, the lesion in a retrograde fashion, much easier than this flush occlusion in integrate fashion. We delivered a thorectomy plus balloon angioplasty in a retrograde fashion on this patient. So not only balloon angioplasty. And, and, and these are our uh, final results. So suddenly this patient went from, from really no vessel runoff to two vessel runoff. And this is the image beyond the access point here. And you can see the pedal loop. You can see the medial and lateral plantar artery. It's not unusual when you have pedal access to have TIMI2 flow or sluggish flow beyond the access point. That's expected because you're injecting against the blood flow. And this is the patient follow-up at 30 days. She had a lateral resection at this area and did actually very well. And, and what's interesting is this patient left from, from our lab within two hours, so we didn't have to keep them overnight. Uh, there was no groin access. I avoided all the complications related to groin access with endovascular therapy. So, you know, we're thinking more beyond just traditional endovascular therapy in some of these patients. Complex patient, uh, by the way, would that first patient make it into best CLI? Our vascular surgeon in our institution was a very capable surgeon, uh, did not feel that the patient is, is suitable for, for open bypass surgery. And, and that, that's why I asked that question, because you know, half of the room said yes, ha, uh, you know, maybe a third of the room said no. So really, you know, do we have that surgical expertise uniform around the country to, to be able to answer this question appropriately? This is another patient that I don't think will make it into best CLI because the patient has um, a, a high-grade stenosis of a common femoral artery occlusion at uh, osseo SFA. And uh, to make matters worse, uh, um, um, uh, no reconstitution at nine seconds. Even at 12 seconds, we're barely getting any contrast, not a very healthy collateral system. And the uh, patient had uh, a low, uh, you know, our, our vascular surgeon uh, 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 did a, a localized common femoral artery endorectomy, not under general anesthesia, which is my understanding this is something that's, you know, not fun for you guys. So uh, um, we still did not feel that the patient was, it would be a candidate for bypass surgery. Um, and we had to perform endovascular therapy on the patient. And to make our life more challenging, obviously we could not use integrate access, something that I, we use in our practice quite a bit. Um, we were not, this is a white stop sign, something I'm gonna discuss in the next talk about uh, case selection for tibial access. This is complete opacification and destruction of a tibial vessel um, and, and, and not allowing us to access, access the vessel at that point. So we had to perform what we, we call the Schmidt technique, the distal SFA access, proximal popliteal access under ultrasound guidance um, and snare our wire in a retrograde fashion from the distal SFA into um, into the contralateral access point. And ultimately in this patient, we chose to perform stenting um, and uh, uh, this is the snare, uh, snaring the wire in a retrograde fashion. And in this particular patient, we chose self-expanding stent, the superior stent because of the calcification in this patient. And uh, you know we're trying to stack to stack the struts of a, uh, of a stent because of the calcification of the patient, and this is the final result. And you know it was not it was not an ideal result. It was not a great result. His, his tibial flow is 
is, is extremely still poor. Um, but nonetheless, we were able at least to, to, to achieve uh, um, 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 limited amputation of a toe and, uh, uh, and his rest pain, uh, which is the, the thing that bothers the patient the most. We were talking about what's important to the patient. The thing that bothers the patient the most is, is the rest pain um, that, that was resolved. So it's not that simple. You know, we always have to think surgery versus endovascular therapy. You know, wound healing, uh, ability to, to, for you guys to operate or for us to access some of these vessels and operate on these patients. You know, um, we need to do, uh, I need to do a better job understanding what's relevant, what's important to you, and, and, and vice versa. Um, you know, I thought I had 20 minutes, so um, I apologize, I'm, I'm going over, but this is another interesting patient. He's 49 years old. He has that wound that you saw on his toe, and this is a tibial fall. And by the way, we were second, second opinion that we saw him. And, uh, and this is his uh, anatomy. Uh, he has occluded dorsalis pedis artery, and he has subtotally occluded uh, uh, distal posterior tibial artery. Would this patient make it to the best CLI? You know, uh, I, might have, I might have a surgeon that's comfortable doing a distal uh, bypass to the lateral plantar artery. I may not. So, you know, again, a lot of questions that we need to ask. We, um, in our institution, um, started uh, the prime registry. Um, the prime registry is a, a registry, clinical registry that looks at endovascular therapy, different aspects of endovascular therapy, because I agree we need to understand better which treatments work. Um, I don't think balloon angioplasty for tibial vessel is a very effective long-term treatment, uh, uh, quite frankly, and especially with the advantage of other treatment modalities like drug balloon technology and immunosuppressive therapy. Um, uh, uh, how is that going to impact our endovascular therapy is yet to be seen. So um, it's, it's a registry that's open, uh, and, and we invite Center to participate in. If you're interested, please send me an email, uh, and we'll offer you some more information about it. Uh, and let's remember why we're all meeting here today. Amputation is not a good thing. Um, you know, our patients do not do very good with amputation, so all of us are working toward the same goal. Our STAM program is a multidisciplinary program. Um, you know, it's really nice when I open the vessel, but you know what? The real work starts right then and there. Our goal is to achieve wound healing from the wound all the way down to, to the wound closure. Um, so in conclusion, I agree. I think surgery should be considered in patients that are able to tolerate with adequate venous conduits an acceptable risk profile, but that, that there's a lot of ambiguity uh, with that statement. Endovascular therapy continues to evolve, uh, and as patient age and significant comorbidities, sometimes it's the only option, and I showed you multiple examples, and I, and I agree, it's anecdotal. Uh, and the goal in CLI patients should be amputation-free survival, not vessel graft patency, or maybe not only amputation-free survival. Um, and if both approaches yield similar outcomes, would surgery still be the first option? And establishing CLI centers that are patient-centered uh, and not necessarily specialty-centered, I think, is a, is, a, is a key component to achieving that goal. Thank you. Can we have the post-debate uh, vote? I became a polarizing figure. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Ten percent only. It was only 10 percent. The statistical variation. So. That's right. Yeah.